So welcome everyone. My name is Linda Gabayas. I am part of the Enterprise Success Team at Lab Archives. I'll be hosting this session today with a focus on your Lab Archives electronic laboratory notebook, or you may prefer to call it electronic research notebook, for the campus of CU Denver Anschutz. Um, you have been a customer of Lab Archives now for a little over a year. We officially launched and rolled out Lab Archives, the research edition notebook um, to all researchers and users on campus uh, last summer. So it was the summer of 2020. So actually beyond the first year here. So I'm going to give you an introduction to the product, to the notebook, how it works, how quickly and easily you can get started. But I also would ask you to stay on after my presentation is done as well, because we're going to have a local speaker uh, kind of wrapping up our hour together today. Uh, his name is Elliot Brooks. He is a member of the Department of Cell Biology, and he's part of the STEM Cells and Development Program. He's also a doctoral candidate, part of the Sussel Lab. So when I am done with my introduction to the product today, he's going to speak about how he has used lab archives in his own lab and with his own research. So I, I think you'll, you'll greatly benefit from that because one of the biggest questions that we do receive when we do lab archives training is to ask and see examples um, and the experience from a real researcher and how they've used and implemented that. So again, I just ask you to stay on when I'm done with my bit of my session today and Elliot will be taking some time and uh, giving us a tour and some background information on how he has used lab archives with his own research. I will be starting with a short PowerPoint presentation, then I'll move over into the live demo. Questions, comments are welcome at any time. You can post those into the chat panel today, and I will be keeping a close eye on that and taking periodic breaks to uh, address your, your items and questions. So first of all, what is Lab Archives? So as I mentioned before, Lab Archives is an electronic laboratory notebook. Other uh, researchers prefer to call it an electronic research notebook, but at its core, Lab Archives is a research data management tool. It is discipline agnostic, meaning it can be used in any discipline. It is not limited to wet lab research, for example. It can be used um, in the humanities, for example. So we have users outside of the medical and health sciences, outside of biology and life sciences that use Lab Archives. Now, we are a cloud-based platform, so the university did a, did a thorough secure, uh, security vetting of us as well, so we have been approved for the use of HIPAA data as well as PHI content as well. Now, being that we're cloud-based, as long as you have internet access, you will have access to your Lab Archives account, which has been especially important with COVID. So many researchers, you know, especially uh, when we were first launching Lab Archives last year, were not working in the lab. They were working at home and being flexible or kind of, you know, carefully rotating time in and out of the lab. So this gives you the opportunity to even use your notebook when you're outside of the lab or working home or working remotely. With Lab Archives, you have a secure place to search, share, and store your research data, even with opportunities to publish data within Lab Archives. Through Lab Archives, we support the pillars of a well-informed data management plan. So what does that mean? So naturally, the university invested their money in this enterprise license because they, they understand the importance of having a secure place to store the research data. But not only do you have an area to store the data, we give you opportunities to apply metadata, which is especially important because applying metadata is going to help to make that information searchable and discoverable for you. So op ample opportunities to apply that metadata, but you also have full control in terms of who has access to your data. Notebooks are private by default. You are in control in terms of who is invited to a notebook. Also down the line, as you, let's say, if from a lab standpoint or research team standpoint, once you adopted lab archives and you start to collect the number of notebooks that you have access to, you then have the ability to search that, use it for archival purposes. Down the road, you know, maybe next year you need to locate an old data set, for example. You'll have access or continue access to those notebooks to be able to retrieve that data. Now, when it comes to getting started with Lab Archives, it's a very simple process. So first of all, the university has set up access to Lab Archives using single sign-on credentials. So you will use those credentials that you already use on a daily basis to log in and use other uh, university-sponsored resources. You'll use those same resources to create your Lab Archives account and then log in with that account and those uh, credentials. You can start by going to mynotebook.labarchives.com to get started, or you can then create your own account. 
count. You can also follow the prompts here where you'll be able to select CU Denver Anschutz from the pull down menu to sign in through your institution and again using those credentials. Several resources that are important for us to point out here. First up would be our support team. So you can reach out to our support team any time of day. We, not quite 24 hours, we're about 22 hours of coverage here because not only do we have team members manning our support desk in the US, we also have teams in the UK and Australia, which makes for a really long technical support day. Questions, comments, anything can be directed to them. We respond to all tickets within the hour but our average is actually closer to 30 minutes. Also below that, you'll find a wealth of resources through our knowledge base. We have well over 100 detailed support articles that have been written that you can browse and search through to quickly locate help topics. Now, let's start about talking about the notebook itself. When you first create your account in your notebooks, of course, they're going to be empty. It's gonna be up to you to populate that data and organize that data. And those are going to be some of our main topics we cover in our session today. You can get data into your notebook through what we call our entry types. We support a variety of different entry types, such as direct entry, email attachments, document uploads, so a variety of ways there, or even by using our mobile device support. We integrate with a number of different applications. Some of our most popular integration partners include Microsoft Office Online, a GraphPad Prism, for example, and SnapGene. Now, in Lab Archives, you are going to securely store all of your data in the cloud. What's really important for you to know is that any file type, any file format can be uploaded to Lab Archives. So it could be even be, you know, unique proprietary software that your, your team has created, for example. Those files can be stored in Lab Archives as long as they are up to four gigabytes in size. So that's your individual attachment space limitation. Now, going beyond that, a single notebook can store up to one terabyte of data. They are massive. Very few of our users actually get to reach a terabyte of space, but we recommend you not really exceed that or get too close to a terabyte of space just because we are a cloud-based product. So it can take some time to pull down that much data from the cloud. You benefit having an enterprise license because that means that you can create unlimited notebooks. So do not torture yourself with a slow notebook. Use that as an indicator of let's create a new notebook. So there's a variety of ways that you can create notebooks and we'll talk about that as well in terms of you know, project-based notebooks or inst uh, individual researcher-based notebooks. Also important to note, you have output options. Once your data is in lab archives, it is not stuck or trapped. You have the ability to output, uh, download or output your entire notebook or even down to an individual entry. Okay. Now, this is gonna be a really important kind of the core component here for us to start with. And those are your permissions in lab archives. And these are the different membership roles that we support. I'm gonna kind of give you a definition of those and how you could use those and utilize them in your own adoption of lab archives. First up in the center of our workspace is the notebook itself. The first person to create the notebook, they are the notebook owner. A notebook can only have one owner. Once you have a notebook owner, it's a notebook owner that decides who will have access to that notebook. Let's use in this scenario here that the notebook owner is the PI for a research team or research lab. That notebook owner then can invite other members to the notebook. The first person they may wanna invite would be an administrator. The administrator in lab archives is well suited for, for example, maybe a lab manager, lab supervisor, perhaps a project lead. The benefit of adding an administrator to your notebook is that they can also invite team members. That's really important too because it helps to take some of the work off of the PI. As PIs, you know, you've got a certain set of responsibilities and you are very busy and you may not have time to actually manage the, you know, access to the notebook. So that's why as a PI, you can own the data, which is, you know, fairly standard process where PIs always own the paper notebooks in the lab as well. They also own the electronic notebooks, but this time the administrator can help administrate access, manage access. Another popular role here, a membership role in your notebooks would be the user. A user in lab archives is really well suited for kind of your traditional research team member. They have full read and write access to the notebook, except they can't invite other members. So that's really the big difference between these roles is first of all, notebook owners can invite members as can an administrator. They both have full read and write access to the notebook. 
A user also has full read and write access to the notebook, but they cannot manage access or invite other members. Another role that's available is the guest role. Guests are really well suited for perhaps external collaborators. Perhaps there's somebody outside the university at a partner university uh, outside that you want to collaborate with. You can invite them as a guest. A guest is given 60 days read and write access, but you can also adjust their access or extend their access at any time. Guests are also well suited for uh, the purposes of maybe they need to see a section of the notebook and not the entire notebook. Building off of that are some potential notebook structures. Now, this is these are just a few ideas. This is meant to be flexible and really to complement your current workflow. I think when Elliot speaks at the end today, he's also going to give us an insight in terms of how they've decided to, to organize their notebooks. Now, here's an example. We have the notebook owner, center of the workspace, and let's say that this is Jack the PI. Jack the PI owns multiple notebooks within his lab. The first notebook he owns is a project-based notebook. This is a Project X notebook. He's invited his entire research team to the notebook. So all research team members that are collaborating, working on this project have access to the notebook where they're adding data, editing data, adding folders, pages, organizing their materials. Another notebook that's part of this lab is an individual researcher-based notebook. This is gonna closely mimic how a paper notebook works, where paper science notebooks were really um, issued to one individual researcher. Similar idea here, where we have the user, let's say is our researcher, and let's say this is Jane, the researcher. Jane's been issued her own electronic laboratory notebook that she's using for all her research notes, updates, data sets. Now, the benefit of being electronic is that the PI has access at any time. They don't have to physically go and take the notebook away from Jane to review her materials. They have instant access to it at any time. The other benefit here is that the PI has also given the lab manager access to that notebook as well to also provide oversight and feedback along the way. Third example here would be an example of what could be like a lab-based notebook. We have a single notebook that should have been generated for the lab. Each member of that lab team or research team has access to their own folders. So let's say John is our first user. John has John's folders. All of his data is going in his folders. Then each team member has their own section of the notebook that they're working in as well. So again, some suggestions for you, just three of the ways you can organize the content. We see a variety of these used. Many, many lab teams will actually have, you know, a, a many of these used at the same time. So it's really very flexible. So with all of that in mind, and as a kind of a background and introduction, introduction to lab archives, I'm going to now go ahead and share my lab notebook that I have up on the screen right now. It's my lab archives research edition. This is my demo notebook that we'll use for the rest of our time during our during our presentation today. We'll start with kind of some basic navigation introduction to what we're looking at here on the screen. So the first thing I want to point out is that the left hand side of the page is your notebook structure. This is how you're going to organize the content within your notebook. In Lab Archives, we have a hierarchical system where at the top of the notebook, here's our name, and that notebook contains folders, and in some cases may also contain subfolders. And within your folders are your pages, and it's your pages that hold on to your content, and that's where you update and upload your data. It's to your pages. And you upload data via entry types. We'll cover that here shortly. But sticking with the structure of the notebook, if you go to the bottom of the notebook structure, all notebooks come with a deleted items bucket. So how deleted items are handled in lab archives is, is unique and it's important for you to understand that. The first fact is, is, is the fact that we do not permanently delete any data from a lab archives notebook. Now that's done for a variety of reasons, but really primarily it's to protect the integrity of your data and of your research. Also helps to protect you against research fraud. It's kind of very similar in line with a paper notebook policy, where if you were keeping a paper science notebook and if you had made an error on a page, you would not rip out that entire sheet of paper, crumble it up, throw it in the trash. Best policy there really and best practices would be to, you know, scratch out your error with a single line, perhaps annotate in the margins or in a separate section of the page. What happened here? Why am I scratching this out? Why should I bypass this and go to the next section on the page? So kind of a similar idea uh, there as well. Now, the also the benefit of us not ever permanently deleting your data is the fact that you have an opportunity to undelete it. 
perhaps that deletion was a mistake. You can come in here, undelete it, and move it back into the main section of your notebook at any time. Sticking within the structure of the notebook, you'll notice there are a series of plus symbols or new menus there. That is where you start to build out the structure of your notebook. So this is where you have the opportunity to add a new page, add a new folder, but also important is the ability to copy materials over. You might need to copy a protocol that's in another notebook, for example, or maybe your lab or research team has created another notebook just for the purposes of managing protocols. So this will give you access and the ability to copy over content based on your level of access. We'll come back here and we'll create a page and we'll get some data in. We'll just kind of continue with our first kind of basic uh, introduction to the navigation and the layout. At the top here of the structure, you'll see I have a notebooks list of 20. These are 20 of the frequently used notebooks that I have access to. So here I have access to 20 of my notebooks. Notebooks that are bolded in black are notebooks that I own. As the owner, I'm in charge. I get to decide who has access to the notebooks. But also, there are other notebooks here that I don't own, but I still have access to. So I, my role could be an administrator, could be a user, could be a guest. So I can still pop in and out of the different notebooks that I have access to here. Now, I have well over 20 notebooks that I have access to, but I can find the rest of my notebooks here in the notebook manager. It's also here where I can create a notebook which is a great first step for all of you today, especially for those of you that are brand new to Lab Archives. After you create your account today, create yourself a notebook. Remember you have access to unlimited notebooks. Create one for just kind of a, you know, like a sandbox, a playground, your first notebook to try out. When you go to create your notebook, it's a very simple process where you give your notebook a name, you choose your folder layout. Now it's optional, the folder layouts. No layout is the default, but we do have sample layouts available. So maybe you know, you're just starting out with lab archives and you're not quite sure what the best layout is for you or your lab team. You could use our lab layout. It gives you a sample structure. And what I mean by uh, sample structure is these are the folders that are pre-populated and created for you. Then within those folders, you will create your own pages or even your subfolders. Okay. In the future, you could also base your new folder structure off of a previous notebook. So you'll choose your option there, or you'll choose no layout and start from scratch. Give it a name, then you click create notebook. It's that simple. You started your own lab archives notebook where you can start adding data. Okay. Now I'm not going to physically take you through that complete process today because we're going to use the demo notebook I already have up. But moving on from that, I also want to point out the very top of our menu here is our search bar. If you use that down arrow, that is your advanced search feature. Now, the advanced search is very, very powerful, and it's definitely one of the benefits of moving from a paper system to electronic system is that now you have the ability to search across your notebook. You don't remember where that data set is. You can do a search for it. But not also can you search the individual, individual notebook you're currently in. You can search any of the notebooks you have access to. So, you know, two years down the line, if you're stu still using Lab Archives, you may have, you know, um, gained access to multiple notebooks. You may not remember what notebook it is that you put that Excel document in. You can search for that document here. One of the benefits too is that when you do a keyword search in our notebook search, you will search within attachments. So you can search within text-based attachments for keywords. An example of a text-based attachment would be um, Excel documents, Word documents, PowerPoints, text-based PDFs. Also, if we look further here within the search menu, you can search different metadata fields like tags, which I'll show you how to use separately in our presentation. You could even search chemical smiles formats here. All users will have a name pull down menu. That's where you can adjust some of your user properties. Activity feed icon, which is a great place to go view recent activities. This is especially good for PIs and lab managers. Here is where you'll have access to our information icon, which is our help hub, such as our knowledge base, which I mentioned earlier. Reach out to our support team as well. So all your help resources are easily accessible here. Now, many of you will not see this icon here. This is to our course manager. This is to a separate edition of Lab Archives. Um, there are some instructors and some students that use it at the university today, but it's not currently part of the enterprise license. So it's a separate version of Lab Archives. 
Separately, Lab Archives has an inventory management tool. Now that is also not part of the current enterprise license, but anybody is welcome to set up a 30-day trial to preview that tool there. And then finally, through our skewer or our more icon um, is a number of features that I will talk about today, such as where you're going to go to download content, or for example, to invite your team members to your notebook. Uh, yep, so let me clarify something. So somebody has asked to clarify about the search. It does allow you to search within text space attachments. So that is correct, Aaron. So that would be like searching within a Word, an Excel, PowerPoint, or text-based PDFs. So you can search within those. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. So that was kind of a quick navigational tour, lay of the land, look at the inside of a notebook. Next, I'm going to go back to my transfection protocol page, give you a tour of, of a populated page, talk about entry types, and then also we'll create a new page and show you how you can get data to a page. This is just a sample page. Certainly every sample page is going to look different. You know, you all have different disciplines, different things you're researching. Your pages will look different. You know, the type of data that you work with is different as well. This page at the top here includes a heading. This is a rich text entry, which is a copy of a protocol. I've got a variety of attachments and image-based documents here. I have an Excel document that's been uploaded, GraphPad Prism, and additional documents all down this page. Now, what you'll find in common across all of the entries in Lab Archives will be a name, date, and timestamp. So this is a major part and one of the benefits of using Lab Archives is that every item is part of our audit trail and we have a full revision history that we keep. We keep track and our timestamp here on the back end through our server logs uses the National Institute of Standards and Technology as the official timestamp, and that does hold up in a court of law. So for patent purposes, for example, that can be used. The revision history will keep track of every edit, every action, every time a document has been touched or revised in some way. So you'll see that for every item in your notebook, so every individual entry. This particular document has a few other things to highlight. It utilized our comments tool. So you can see there, I'll show you how that works, but also we've applied tags, which is a great way to add metadata, helps you to discover the documents down the road. Each entry has its own unique toolbar here as well, which we'll touch on with opportunities to edit, move information, user comments, share, view our revision history. Now what we're going to do is create a new page here, go to our plus menu, add new page, and we'll call this our CU Denver. I always misspell Anschutz, so I hopefully I've gotten it right today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click add. We've got a new page that we've added. Page naturally is empty. We're going to start to embed or import add data to the page. I'll give you a variety of examples of how to do that today. Now, the first thing, of course, is to point out that through the plus menu or that new menu, that supports all of our entry types. You'll also eventually see some shortcuts across the page like I do. The first one I want to introduce you to is our rich text entry, which is basically a little mini word processing tool that's been built into Lab Archives. You can type directly into that box or you can copy and paste. So I have some data that I'm copying and pasting. I realize you can't see me doing that, but I'm going to go ahead and add it right now where you'll see me paste it in. Now it detected that I pasted that from Word. It's asking me if I want to keep the version as is or give a cleaned up version. I'll go ahead and do a cleaned up version. Now, any of this can be modified. I've got different tools here to adjust font color, size, indentation, center it. We can add bulleted lists and numbered lists, embed URLs. So if I need a link out to an outside resource, I can do that. Images, uh, video files, embed tables even. So you're going to click Save. And that's my first example of an entry. And you'll see with my name, date, and timestamp included. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had a question. Um, can you export portions of the notebook as PDF files in order to save backup hard copies? Yes, you can. So you can download or export your entire notebook as a PDF or into what we call as an offline format. But also, if you right click a page or a folder, so I'll right click the folder, you have a PDF option there. So that'll allow you to do a portion of your notebook, which I think is what you were after there, Jenna. 
So you could right click a page or a folder to do that PDF export. Yep. And then for again, for your purposes, you want to save backup hard copies. That's how you would do that. Now let's add some additional entries here. Let's talk about attachments. So I mentioned attachments earlier in the intro. You can upload up to 50 attachments at a time, four gigabytes per attachment. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and browse and add some files here. Now you do have an opportunity to also drag and drop the files on the page if you prefer. So I have, I'm going to select an Excel document to upload, and I'm going to go ahead and take some image-based documents here and add those to the page. I'm going to click open. Now I have the ability to describe the attachment as well. So if I want to, you know, just make note that these are tied to project X as my metadata, I could do that. Click save to page. Each item will upload, get its own entry space and include that description that I added. So I have my Excel file, I've got a gel doc, and a few other image-based documents on the screen here. Each again with its own unique name, date, and timestamp. Another common um, uh, type of entry would be a heading. So now that I have multiple entries on the page, if I hover between entries, I can use the insert flag, in, which essentially lets me direct where I want my next entry to go, and I want a heading. And let's say I want to call this protocol. So I click Save to Page. Now, headings are a great way to essentially kind of separate the content on the page, a way to organize your page. Now, the problem is with my heading, let's say it's out of place. I can then use these arrows to correctly organize it. So I put protocol at the top, you know, then let's say here I want to come in and add an additional heading. And let's say I want to call these, you know, raw raw data files, click save to page and have those all then appear below that heading. So that's an example of how you could use the, uh, the entry types. A couple of other um, entry types to discuss and introduce you to as well, include our folder monitor and Microsoft Office plugin tool. If there's interest to use these two tools, they are required that you download them separately. So to your PC, to your Mac. Those two downloadable features are part of our more or skewer icon there and part of downloads, folder monitor, Microsoft Office plugin. I will introduce you to them first so then you can decide if that's a particular you know, uh, a tool you may use, therefore you would wanna download them. I do have examples for you available here already. Some screenshots just makes it a little easier for me to discuss them and introduce you to them. The first one being folder monitor. So Folder Monitor allows you to create a rule where we will watch a local file folder on your PC or your Mac. Let's say you've got a lot of data that you've been using for research purposes stored locally on your PC, and you want it quickly to get them into lab archives. One way to do that is to use Folder Monitor to create a rule. We will then watch that folder. Anytime a new document goes in that folder or a document that's in that folder has been edited, we will upload that new data, those new changes, those new documents, the new data to Lab Archives for you automatically. And you'll do that by creating a rule here through Folder Monitor. And then the key thing to consider, you know, in terms of is Folder Monitor right for you, you are limited to attachments up to 250 megabytes. Okay, so that'll be kind of your consideration there. Some, some use case scenarios we see for, for Folder Monitor. A great use case would be if you are working with software that generates a lot of images, a lot of files. Sometimes imaging software can generate hundreds of files a day, for example. If you can direct those files to be sent to your local file folders on your PC, on your Mac, Folder Monitor might be a great option because it will then automatically import and add that data to Lab Archives for you. The other optional downloadable tool that also helps you to get data into Lab Archives is our Microsoft Office plugin. So this is especially great if you, let's say, spend a lot of time in Excel. You know, you're gathering, inputting data on a daily basis, and that's one of the tools that you use the most. That would allow you to launch Excel from your PC, from your Mac, add in your data, and very quickly send it to Lab Archives. My previous example, when I uploaded an attachment, so just to refresh your memory, if I go back to our, our page that we created, 
Remember, I manually uploaded this attachment by using the browse and attachment feature. The other way though, of course, that we were showing you here via the plugin is to open an Office document, Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, and then send it to Lab Archives. So I'm gonna show you that option next. Um, these are not the correct Excels, but bear with me here. I'm just gonna close out of these. And then I'm going to launch a fresh Excel, a blank workbook. And when I go to my file menu, this has a plugin installed. So this is one of the ways you can work with Excel documents, for example. So let's do our blank workbook. Let's add data. So data, data. I've added my data. I'm going to save the document locally first. So we'll do it to the desktop. So I've saved the document. It's locally available on my PC, but I also need to have a copy of my lab archives notebook. So after I save, I go to the file menu. I go to save as to lab archives. I will follow the prompts and log in. After logging in, I need to choose the notebook and the page, the folder where I want to send the data. So this is my research notebook. I'm going to choose lab protocols. I'm going to choose that page that we just created for our demo today. I'm going to send that document to lab archives. So now when I go back into lab archives and our CU Denver Anschutz page, I scroll to the bottom. There's that Excel document that we just sent. So that's another way to get your data to lab archives when you're using office documents. Now, Sticking with the theme of working with Office documents. Remember the document we just uploaded a few minutes ago? I browsed for it, it was saved locally on my computer. One of our integration partners you may remember is Microsoft Office Online. That, and the benefit of that, is that I can actually view and edit this document live within Lab Archives. So I have the ability to view here, but I also have the ability to edit it. So I can open that document while I'm in my Lab Archives session, but also, any of my colleagues can open the document at the same time because it does allow for si simultaneous viewing and editing. I can make some quick changes. So let's say I just want to very quickly highlight some text, highlight some content here. So I've done that, made that change. Automatic saving is included. That is going to refresh, update. You'll see I've got a new timestamp. And then any of my team can continue to do that. Now, what usually follows this is this question. Did those changes save back to my PC? The answer is no. When and if you opt to use this feature in Office Online, you're only changing the version available in Lab Archives. So then if you need a matching version, remember you can always download back a copy to your PC. Now, here's the potential or one of the use case scenarios in terms of why would I wanna use the plugin? Well. The plugin example is going to be really good for, again, heavy Office document users that would prefer to view a document or edit a document from the desktop version of Excel. Now, that would be done potentially because, let's say, um, if we compare the Office Online version of Excel to your desktop version, it can be lacking in some features. It's a scaled back version. There could be some advanced calculation or formula tools that are lacking. So you may just feel more comfortable launching lab archives from your desktop. And then let's say I'm coming back in, I'm adding more data tomorrow. Now, remember, I've already connected this document to lab archives. I go to save it. And I get this prompt because it then reminds me that this document has been connected into lab archives, then asking me if I want to also save a copy. Now, do you want to do that? So that's going to be one of the benefits and kind of the comparison, you know, compare and contrast the two versions. It's up to you how you want to work with them. It's just based on your workflow preferences. Yeah. So great question. Audrey, I think I answered your question there. So if you're using the Microsoft Office plugin and you saved it on your computer, it will prompt you and ask you if you want to save it in Lab Archives. So you've got that right. That's only if you're using the plugin. If you opt not to use the plugin, you would have to just manually upload it back into Lab Archives. So 
So there's another question. Um, is there a way to import my data from labfolder.com? Yes, uh, there is. So most other ELN services have an export feature. So as long as labfolder.com has a way for you to export the data, whether it's at an individual record level or the entire notebook, you can upload that into Lab Archives. Because remember, you can upload any file type, any file format. The consideration for you to make, Stephanie, is how much data is it? How onerous is that going to be? So it would really be up to you to decide what's the data you should move over. Some teams, for example, that use a previous ELN and are thinking about adopting Lab Archives may decide that, you know, they're going to start using Lab Archives, let's say, October 1st. All new data is going to go into Lab Archives October 1st. But anything that the lab created prior to that, they'll continue, for example, to go to Lab Folder to retrieve the older data. So it's, 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 it's personal preference. You know, do you have to go back and, and put everything that you did prior into Lab Archives? Again, that would be a kind of a personal team decision on that. But again, so in labfolder.com, look for the export features. So either at an entry level or your entire notebook, or perhaps at a folder level, and that will be what you bring into Lab Archives. When you do that in Lab Archives, you first, of course, want to create your notebook and your structure, and then you'll import that data in. So I got another question. Does the newly saved data from the desktop overwrite the original document? Is there a way to see the original document? Great question. Let's do this one right here. Okay, so remember this was the, the one we used with the plugin and I made some changes and we updated it. Okay, this gives me a perfect opportunity to talk about the revision history. So each entry has its own entry toolbar. From the entry toolbar, I'm going to click view revisions. This is the revision history for this single record. It does allow me to revert to earlier versions. So if I want to go back to the original, I can do that there. Okay. Now, it doesn't, if, if you want to see it just for viewing purposes, you can't do that. You do have to first revert to the earlier version there. But then you can always revert back. Because so, for example, if I go to revert to this version, click OK. And then I go back to my revision history at the bottom that action itself becomes part of the revision history as well, also with the ability to revert. Yeah. So all of that's captured with your office documents. Um, some other entry types to very quickly introduce you to as well. Um, I will very quickly talk about widgets. Widgets are essentially mini HTML applications that you can add to Lab Archives. In Lab Archives, there's about 24 built-in widgets. Two of our most popular widgets are the freezer box widget, database widget. You can also build and create your own widgets. Okay. So just to quickly demonstrate for you, if I go to the new menu and select widget, that's where you'll see our pop-up menu. Uh, there are 24 or so supported widgets, a lot of calculators, inventory forms, for example. You can check those out, see if any of them kind of match up with your research and your discipline. And then you simply will just add them to a page. So let's say it's our freezer box widget here. Very quickly, use that. Customize the freezer box widget. It's going to be at the bottom of my page. You know, change the size, start embedding the data there. For those that want to look into custom widgets, that's available from the skewer icon and widget manager. That is something we actually recommend a separate session on. If anybody wants to investigate that, reach out to our support team. We can set up a one-on-one -on -one consult with you to talk about your needs and help you get started creating a custom widget. Basic HTML is required and really nothing beyond that is needed to create a basic widget. Okay, so let me uh, get back to our page here. Um, I've talked about already a few of these features. So we talked about adding data, a little bit about editing and managing data. We looked at the revision history. A few other things I want to point out. Coming back here and also about managing data from our skewer icon at the entry level, I want to talk about tags and links. Tags allow you to you know, create your own you know, controlled vocabulary. Maybe it's going to be project-based vocabulary. And you can assign tags to your records. You notice I've got some different tags I've used previously. I can reuse them, or I can create my own tag. 
So after selecting the tag, clicking close, that tag is added to the document or the entry. Then when I select that tag, it's going to search my notebook and bring me back any other documents using the CRISPR tag. So we can see that there. Okay, this is a great way again to help search and retrieve, discover information when you need it the most. I'll be using our tags. If I go back to our previous page here, I also want to point out our linking feature. Also part of this little side skewer icon menu at the entry level, links are a great way to easily link out to other sections of the notebook or to data outside of the notebook. So for example, if you have a series of results that you've listed here and you want to note what protocol you used, for example, that would be a great way to use this particular tool. What you do is you browse your notebook for that entry. So let's say it's part of my you know, transfection protocol notebook or my page. I select the protocol, select a link. Do I want to use the version, which is the most current, or the version when the link was created? It's an important question. If your protocols change over time, a lot of times they do, you adjust them. You might want to do the version when this link was created. Add a link, click close. That little indicator there is like almost like a note card that you can click on, gives you a little annotation there in terms of what you're linking to, to view the original protocol. Okay. Now, if I go back to our page here as well, um, a little bit more about managing data, then we're gonna talk about inviting people to the notebook, and then we'll pass it over to Elliot to give you uh, some information on how he's incorporated lab archives into his research. Yep, so Karen, I'm going to talk about your question here in just a minute when we talk about access control and permission. So I will do that. First thing, very quickly, bell icon, which is our activity feed. Great place for PIs, project managers, project leads, lab supervisors to go. It's a quick look at recent activity. What's gone on in the notebook lately? Who's been in or who hasn't been in? What have they added? That's what the activity feed will do for you, where you have different categories and activities to sort on. From the activity feed, let's talk about managing access. We're going to do that through notebook settings. So I'm going to my notebook settings tab. As an owner, I have some controls here, default settings I can adjust. But the key, key thing I want to focus on here would be user management. This is how you will decide who has access to the notebooks. So remember, if you're a notebook owner, you'll have access to user management, but also if you're a notebook administrator. So what you'll do is just click the new user button there, and you just invite the, uh, your colleagues, your collaborators using an email address. Okay. So once, they once you invite a member to the notebook, they'll receive an email indicating they'd be invited to the notebook where they can accept the invitation. If you're inviting someone prior to them creating an account, when they accept the invitation to the notebook, they'll be taken through the process to complete the uh, account activation. It's also here, Karen, where you can invite an external collaborator. So that's really one of the benefits to the Enterprise License to Lab Archives is you can invite anybody you want to the notebook. It does not have to be a member of your local research community, be a you know, neighboring institution, somebody across the globe, for example. So any email address you could use, a like Gmail, Yahoo, if they're at the University of Pittsburgh, for example, you can do that. So the key thing is, Karen, is whether or not that person has a Lab Archives account. If they're part of an institution that doesn't have an enterprise license, they can view your notebook using a free edition account. Or I use the University of Pittsburgh as an example. They have an enterprise license to Lab Archives, so they'll be able to view it using their own local account. There are even options for researchers to buy individual licenses to lab archives. So I've got another question about, um, is lab archives a good place to keep track of document versions as people edit them, paper revisions, for instance? It, it is, um, Ruth. So you saw that example I used of the Excel document. You'll have each of the revisions available for a Word document, for example. So you can certainly do that, yeah. Because through that revision history, you'll see each of the revisions there that are available where you could also revert to earlier versions. We as a team locally, we do that as well. We use lab archives for internal projects and documents that we're creating as well. So they can all be stored there in one local place. 
Yep, so absolutely. Now, what I, um, continuing on with user access here, I left off where I invited somebody to the notebook. They received an email and they've accepted the invitation to join the notebook. When you first invite someone, they're given this user role here, Hermione, okay? But then as soon as you invite them, change their role, upgrade them to an administrator, downgrade them to a guest. Also, you can remove their access. So this is especially important because remember, as an owner, administrator, you control who has access to the notebook. Let's use Hermione as an example. Grad student is graduating, moving on, leaving the university, no longer contributing to our research projects. You can remove her access, but when you remove her access, it does not take away her contributions. Any data she's added is there. She's still part of the revision history, part of the audit trail. She simply loses access. So you have the ability to do that on your own. This notebook also is giving you an example of our signing and witnessing feature. You control whether or not you want to apply this and use this in your notebook. And signing a page is a way to lock the content on the page. A lot of our research partners do this where that, for example, when an experiment ends, they have a local policy that they lock that page so no more edits can take place to the page. Witnessing is kind of an extension of that. So if I from here go to one of my sample pages, I will show you what a signed page looks like. And bear with me here, I just may have to refresh my page. Bear with me, I think I've just frozen a bit, but no worries, I um, will log back in. We have a new um, security protocol in terms of how we log into notebooks as well. So I might just have to log myself back in. Nope, we're good. Okay, I was going to show you sign pages. So now that I'm back in, here's an example of a sign page where it's locked, okay? Page signing occurs at the page tools. That's a little toolkit upper right-hand corner of the page. That page has been signed by somebody that's been given permission to sign pages. The next level of that that you could turn on is a witnessing feature where someone signed the page. We also require the witnesser to come in and give their final stamp of approval. Okay. If you utilize page witnessing, when someone signs the page, they choose the witnesser. A witnesser receives a notice, just letting them know a page is, is pending their witness. The final thing I want to cover before I turn it over to Elliot to talk about his experience using Lab Archives is your downloading option. Now, you can download your notebook in two different ways. This is your entire notebook as an offline zip file or as a PDF. These two features are available from the skewer icon where you'll go to our utilities and there you can choose offline notebook or notebook to PDF. The zip file option is offline, okay, so it's your notebook available offline, including every attachment. The PDF option is a little different. You don't get every attachment. What you get instead is a link to download your attachments. So here, for example, if I needed access to the PowerPoint, I could separately download that. And also as a reminder, somebody had asked this question earlier. Remember that you can right click on a section of a notebook to download using the PDF feature. So the page level or the entry level, for example, or even the folder level. I think I have one more thing that I can squeeze in for you here. And let me show you an example of a template. So page templates are wonderful. A lot of our teams will incorporate the use of templates into their notebooks. And a template basically just gives you, you know, the, the structure there in terms of how you might want to format a page. Especially if you're going to be integrating and using lab archives across your team, you might want to standardize, you know, how the data is entered and added to a page. This is one template page example for adding data analysis or clinical type of research data into your notebook. It's essentially just a series of headings, rich text entries, which indicate what you'll store here. Okay. So I give you that just for inspiration, ideas in terms of how you could do that and roll out lab archives across your team. And remember, content can be copied. So you'd use the plus menu, copy existing page. So if this were a template I wanted to copy and reuse, I just want to navigate to where that's available. 
and choose the template and a copy will be created of that page. You see it has copy in the name. I can rename that. And here's now my templated version that I can edit. All right. Um, I'm going to take this question that's come in. Uh, two more questions here, and then I'll pass it over to you, Elliot. What are the limitations for the free account version? Oh, so the free account version limitations are size. A free account um, has size limitations, whereas your enterprise account, you can create as many notebooks as you like, essentially almost as large as you like, up to a terabyte in space. Yeah. So the example is given first use with student interns from other universities. Yeah. So that's going to be your, your restriction there, Melissa. However, it may not be a key restriction for you if those interns will never create their own notebooks. If they just need an account more to be able to view the data, they'll be okay. They, they'll run into the restriction size limitations when they try and um, upload or create their own notebooks. Yep, so likely you'll be okay if they're interns from other universities. If they happen to have lab archives at their institution, you're in luck, but otherwise they can use the free edition accounts. Um, other options would be, Melissa, to see if your university would allow them to have credentials under your university. So they can get a CU Denver Anschutz email account, for example. That probably means they'll get single sign-on credentials and they might be able to have full access, but that's a question for your IT team. Well, the benefit, so I've got a question. What's the benefit of using this over Microsoft Teams or OneDrive? Gosh, there's a lot of benefits. You've got revision history. You have audit trail. You have the ability to search your notebook or multiple notebooks. It's discipline agnostic. Um, our product support, our customer support. It's also been completely vetted by your university where they're allowing it for HIPAA and PHI data. So we are secure. We go through a lot of protocols, compliance reviews as well for our security. So they're going to be your main benefits. So next what I'm going to do, I am going to um, pass this over to Elliot, which I had introduced earlier, Elliot Brooks. Um, so Elliot, I am going to make you a co-host which should then give you the Zoom controls to start sharing your screen, if you'd like, or bringing up a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, and we can hear you, great. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, so can everyone see my uh, notebook page here? Yes. Okay, great. So hi, I'm Elliot, uh, grad student at CU Anschutz uh, in Dr. Lori Sessel's lab. Um, so I've been using this for about a year, I think. Um, and I'm, I think I'm the only one in the lab who uses it. So my notebook structure, uh, or at least the, the permissions are actually weird. Um, I'm the owner and Lori is a guest. I might have to change that, but I was kind of flying without a lot of information. So this was a really awesome session because I really got to you know, fine tune my knowledge of how to use this program. Um, but so I only have one notebook and it's my, my main project. Um, and so I study a lot of different things. I study mouse, my, you know, this NKX gene in mice. I study it um, in cell culture. I do um, like bioinformatic analysis and I do immunofluorescence. So I do a lot of different stuff. Um, for instance, like I have a uh, genotyping folder here um, which is just, I work with one mouse line, but I have all my different genotypes or different um, mouse numbers. And within the page, um, let's say I want to view the actual genotypes. I have the Excel file here and, and you can like, see it from the actual page, which is great. Um, but if I want to see it a little bit better, I can go in, um, but I also upload my gel documents. And so this is really important. Like say I'm in the, in the, um, the mouse facility and I've, forgotten my list of mice to study. I can log on to lab archives on my phone and look at all of my genotyping data and even do a quick double check to make sure I've uh, actually made the correct call on the genotype. So this is this is a really awesome thing for mouse work um, and keeping all the genotypes handy. 
Um, I also, for instance, uh, let's look at a current experiment that I'm doing. Uh, it's a cell sorting experiment that'll eventually end in um, RNA-seq. Um, and so I have uh, a lot of different pages here. I've got my protocol page. I've got um, just like an initial, like how to operate the fax machine notes. Um, and I've also got just kind of my initial sort, which has uh, a notes page, but also um, and the notes page has, you know, different days where I've added, you know, bolded fonts and, and added different, different little notes, added a, a, a nice little text box or a table here. Um, but I also have my images from the fax uh, machine um, showing my actual plots, my scattered plots. Um, let's see. And I've uploaded a picture of the, you know, of various uh, Im important like, you know, the Petri dishes from where the cells were and stuff like that. Um, but I also have like important stuff about the next part of this specific experiment um, where I have, uh, you know, the different cDNA synthesis template and then my results from that particular qPCR to validate my cells. Um, and then in the same experiment, um, so I have different experimental sorts here. I have my note, notes about the mice, um, which mice I used, uh, the, the different yields from the IS isolation and stuff like that. I have, I've uploaded very specific fax uh, files, um, which is great. I can keep them here. I don't know if I can actually view them because I don't have the program, but um, I can also view the, the grabbed images from that fax machine. So this kind of goes over, you know, I can view my genotypes. I can view like really specific um, experimental notes, uh, upload just kind of accessory files just so they have them um, and they're never lost. Um, but I also do a lot of um, bioinformatics. And so with bioinformatics, there's a lot of different types of um, files that are generated from that type of analysis. So um, for example, in my bioinformatics folder here, um, I have a couple uh, kind of larger inf informatic um, like topics, I guess. So here's a transcription factor motif search. Um, and I have a, a, a page for plots, a page for my, um, yeah, so a page for my plots that I generate, you know, so I upload them all in bulk. Uh, now this is like a lot, a lot of <laughs> output. So I just caught, I mean, it was great that I was able to just kind of dump it all here. Um, but I can also go through and look at this or, or easily show um, my advisor. Um, and I also have a little section here where I've uploaded all the different data frames, all the different data that I actually generated from that analysis. But I think what's also cool is that I can, I just have the entire directory in a zip file uploaded so that if I ever lose something on my computer, I can download the zip file and I immediately have all of the folders that I ever had for this particular analysis. Um, I don't know, I've never actually tried um, here's like the, the R markdown file, which is the actual analysis file that I use on my computer. I haven't actually tried to open it. Let's see what happens when I open it. It just downloads it. Um, and I noticed that there was a Jupyter Notebook uh, accessibility. I usually use R. So um, Linda, if you, <laughs> uh, it, it would be really awesome if there was um, accessibility for uh, R, R Studio. Um, and files and stuff like that, but maybe that'll be uh, in the future. So I kind of structure my notebook as, um, you know, I have my different experiments and the different types of experiments, immunofluorescence and, and blood glucose measurements, and I study diabetes. So, um, and within that, I have lots of, you know, different folders. And, and so I, I learned a lot of stuff today. Like, I think one of my favorite things was that I, um, the linking thing, I didn't know that about that. So I would totally link all of these these experiments. I would link back to this dissociation protocol because um, I use it in all of these experiments down here. Let's see, we have a question. Um, have you figured out a good way to keep track of your bioinformatics steps in the notebook? Um, so no, um, I, I make it a point to in my R markdown file, um, where I do like all of the actual like R coding is I, I have really extensive notes in there. Um, and so in order to view these, uh, you'd have to download it and open it into RStudio. I haven't found a way to actually view um, my code and my notes in, um, 
in the lab archive notebook yet. Um, like I said, there was a Jupyter notebook accessibility. So for Python, it might be possible, but I don't, I don't know if there is um, for our studio. Um, yeah. Let's see, I think that, that if there are any questions, I, I'm happy to answer them, but I think that's kind of how I, I, um, I organize my notebook, notebook is usually by experiment and then by day. Um, and I just, I like to have lots of specific folders inside them. Um, and, you know, especially for things like bioinformatics, it's good to have, oh, that's not a good example, you know, my plots and then analysis. And then, you know, it's really great way to compartmentalize your data. Um, so it's easy to find. And Elliot, I can, I can, I think I can partially answer your question there. You talked about, you sure. know, the R Studio files. No, we don't have a direct integration with them like we do with Jupyter. Um, I'll pass that over to our product management team. But what could, I mean, it could potentially be helpful for you. We do have an entry type format. It's called our plain text entry editor. And that's mm -hmm. where you can put markup language and coding yeah. as an entry. Now, I don't know enough about R space or, you know, the R studio files to compare mm -hmm. and contrast if that would work for you. But that is something that's available with our plain text entry. Um, otherwise, it is, as you said, if it's a file type there, you would just select it, you would download it, and then you'd have to go ahead and launch it directly from um, our space. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any other questions, or maybe Linda, do you have a question for me that I can demonstrate something? Um, happy to do any of that. <laughs> No, I think I've got it because you know, you've got an interesting case there where you're the only one using it. So you, you're yeah. in control. You set up kind of the, the structure there. You've invited your PI. So I think you've given us a good look at your structure. Um, I would ask, have you ever, are you using widgets or anything like that? Have you ever considered that as something yeah. that you would need? So I, I, like I said, I didn't, I haven't taken, I did all this. I think it's, it's, complements the program. I did all this without any classes or any like mm -hmm. instruction. I just kind of went in and figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually seemed really intuitive to me to this, this the way that this, this is set up. Um, I did see the widgets and I think I just stayed away from them because I didn't know what they were. But mm -hmm. now there, I, I think that after this session, there are lots of things I would use widgets for like, my, you know, freezer boxes, for instance, or buffer um, concentration mm -hmm. calculations, things that, um, I had to look up any all uh, every time anyways, it'd be nice to, mm -hmm. to um, just be able to do that. Uh, there's lots of really quick little tips that I, that I gained from this. So, um, yeah, so I haven't used a widget yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I see the message there too. So Carmen, you had asked about, could a widget be used to do that? Potentially, you know, widgets are just kind of up to, I guess, the, the, the creator there, you know, what's your HTML knowledge? You can with widgets also, if you know JavaScript, you can create an even more sophisticated widget, um, you know, for the, for the entry and the control of data there. So we have a lot of teams that create those. And what's nice about widgets too, they can be shared. So if you create a widget, let's say your lab is, you know, across your lab is using, um, lab archives, those widgets can be shared so everybody on your team has access to them. Well, I think this is great, Elliot. This is, you know, this is always our big thing. You know, people want to see live examples. What has one of their own done? You know, I, I'm not yeah. a researcher. You know, I work for lab archives. I'm a librarian. So my background is in data management, you know, managing electronic resources. So, you know, my job is really to show you the ease at which it can be done. But Elliot's really given you the proof that you know, that can be done. So he's done this, like he said, without really training, just picking it up, figuring it out on his own. Um, I will say here, as far as follow-up goes, remember, you can reach out um, to support at labarchives.com. We can do one-on-one -on -one consults with teams as well. So that's something we can do, or even with you as an individual researcher to kind of just sit down and think about, okay, what type of data do you work with? How many people on your team? Or, you know, what are your ideas for, for rolling this out? And that's something that we can work with you on. I also very quickly will share with you, the university has created a wonderful local page for additional support as well. And I'm just bringing that up on the screen here too. This is another great resource that you have, you know, for using lab archives. They've created a lot of great FAQs here that you can look at too. So, you know, one of the FAQs was using PHI, using HIPAA data, version controls. So a lot of those great details are available here. I think they even posted maybe some of our um, 
sessions in the past, uh, recordings um, that are available here as well. And even if you reach out to your local lab archives team, they can't answer the question, they'll send you over to myself. So I'm always happy to meet one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with researchers or with teams to do a console and talk about, you know, using lab archives locally. We are going to have a great event coming up in October as well. It's our virtual user group event where researchers will be presenting on how they've used lab archives as well. So we are going to be sure that everybody is, is, uh, knows about that. So current users will be notified, but also we'll be working with your local contacts to help spread the word about that event. I will also be sharing the link to the recording with your local contacts as well. They'll distribute that and post that. Um, and then I would just say, remember, support at labarchives.com. Any future questions you may have can be directed there. And we're ready to help you get started. So don't hesitate to let us know if you have any questions. And I know we went over. So thanks for those of you that were able to stay. Um, and thank you so much, Elliot. I, I appreciate this. I think this was great. So I, I appreciate you, you sitting in and giving it kind of your, your tour from your perspective and how you use lab archives. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, I will stay on in case anybody has any other questions. Certainly, I know you guys have other places to go. So if you've got to run, feel free to do that. But I'll, I'll hang out here for another five minutes or so in case there are more questions. In the meantime, I'll also go ahead and end the recording. Thank you, everybody.